as the people of God, as Christians, that's God's expectation and mandate as the Creator to His people, the church. That's why we meet every Sunday formally as a local church to give Jesus Christ all the glory. We have the privilege now to do that as we look to God's Word together. If you get your Bible out, and we're going to study God's Word together. While you're getting your Bible together, I would welcome any sixth, fifth graders on down. Kids, if you want to be part of Children's Church, you can head to the back lobby there. Breaking down, I think, into two groups today, younger and older, with DRJR, as I like to call them, and Amy Brown. They'll have a great time studying the Bible. And we will continue our worship by studying the Bible as well. I would invite you to read three scriptures with me before we jump into Luke chapter 1. These are simple, but they're going to set the stage for what we're looking at in Luke chapter 1. And the first one is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. This is the very beginning of creation. This is a literal historical account. This was 6,000 years ago or so. Adam and Eve, who were real people, disobeyed God, and God punished them because God can't tolerate sin, and the curse that he gave is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14 and the following, and in the midst of his curse, punishment that he gives the first two humans that even impacts us today, in the midst of the punishment and the wrath of God towards sin is a blessing intended for humanity of all the ages, including us. It's a prophecy as well. It's in Genesis 3, 15. Starting at verse 14, actually, the Lord God said to the serpent, that was a real snake that Satan utilized to tempt Adam and Eve. God punishes that snake and Satan who is inside of the snake and it says, because you've done this, cursed are you more than all cattle. He cursed the actual animal. More than every beast of the field, on your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. So that's the curse on the actual snake of the animal. Then God curses Satan who is inside of that snake in verse 15. And God said to Satan, I believe, I will put hatred between you. I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, Eve. Animosity, antagonism. It will be perpetual. It will go on throughout history. There will be war. This is spiritual war. This is against Satan. He's a spiritual being. There will be hatred between you and the woman, starting with the woman Eve, the mother of all the living. But your war won't stop with Eve. She will have descendants. She'll have children. She'll have many all throughout history, and the war will continue through all of her descendants, at least through a specific line of her offspring and descendants. That's the next phrase. I'm going to put enmity, war, and hatred between you and the woman, and also between your seed, Satan, your offspring, Satan, and also her seed, her descendants, offspring of Eve, the woman. Seed refers to offspring people. So this is a promise from God. There will be at least a person at some point who literally comes out of the loins of Eve who is going to be at war with Satan in a unique and significant way, doing something that no one else in history has been able to do. And that's the next phrase in the verse. Between your seed and her seed, the offspring, one seed will come and in the Hebrew it says he, that's singular masculine, he, whoever this offspring of Eve is, will be a man. And whoever this man is, he's a human, he shall bruise or literally crush the head of Satan. It's metaphorical, but it's a literal action that's going to take place. So this offspring of Eve is going to eventually crush Satan and his work. And First John, Hebrews say that's exactly what Jesus did when he came 4,000 years later, he, he crushed Satan, the work of Satan. Yet, Satan, you're going to be allowed to hurt him. You'll bruise him on the heel. And Jesus got bruised, right? He was injured. He was hurt. He was crucified. It was temporary. He rose again from the dead. Genesis 3.15, the first real explicit promise of good news, the gospel, the Messiah in the Bible, given 6,000 years ago. And it was right after the fall of man and sin and the curse. So God gave hope at the very beginning. 
The rest of the Bible really is a commentary on Genesis 3.15. The rest of the Bible is an unfolding and developing the fuller meaning of Genesis 3.15. That's one way to look at it. I believe that's true of who this Messiah would be. So now fast forward 2,000 years after this promise is given. Look at Genesis chapter 12, starting at verse 1. Another promise God gives. So God gives a promise that a Messiah will come an offspring will come. He will be a man. He'll come from the loins of Eve. He's going to crush Satan. And then God gives a little more detail 2,000 years later of how this is going to be, who he will be, what he will accomplish, whoever this seed of the woman is. So God calls Abram. Genesis 12.1, Abram is about 75 years old at this time. He's a pagan. He's an idol worshiper. He doesn't deserve anything from God, but God in his grace selects or elects Abram for a special purpose. He calls him. He's over there in Iraq, that part of the world. And God makes a special supernatural visitation to Abraham or Abram at the time and calls him really out of his paganism and unbelief and he makes a promise and he says go forth from your country leave this place over here in Iraq Iran Babylon leave your relatives leave your father's house and go to the land which I will show you that land was 500 miles to the land that we know as Palestine or Israel first it was like the land of the Canaanites go to that land And verse 2, the promise continues, if you do, I will make you a great nation. That's the promise. I'm going to make you a great nation. One man. That was God's promise to Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant. This is one of the, probably the greatest promise in the Old Testament. This is related to Genesis 3.15. It's a promise. It's going to be formalized in a covenant. How do you get a nation from one man? What do you need? Descendants, offspring, people. That's where God's going to grow the nation of Israel. What else do you need to have a nation? You need land. That's why they're going to go into the promised land. What else do you need? Laws. You need a government. That's the Mosaic Covenant. God's going to fulfill this promise. I'm going to make you a great nation. I will bless you. Abraham's going to get saved. He got saved about age, age six by grace through faith and the promises of God. And I'm going to make your name great, Abram, and so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. Key verse the end of verse 3, and in you, Abram, all the families of the earth will be blessed. If you're a Christian today, you are in that verse. You are fulfillment of verse 3. In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed because what God meant there was through the loins of Abram, the Messiah would come and he'd be the savior of the world and not just savior of the Jews. He would also be savior of Gentiles who believe in Jesus by grace through faith. Galatians chapter 3, verse 8 says this is the gospel. That's what it calls it. Gen Galatians 3, 8 calls Genesis 12, 3 the gospel. This is good news. And this is the Abrahamic covenant. So God is going to bless the world through someone who's going to come and be born of Abraham. Okay, let's go to one more. End of the Old Testament. Last book in the Old Testament, just before Matthew in the New Testament. So now you go from that promise 6,000 years ago to the promise made to Abraham, which is in 2000 B.C. And now we're going to fast forward to about 400 B.C. So we're going to go catapult about 1,600 years from the time this promise was made to Abraham to the end of the New Testament, to the book of Malachi. Look at the last chapter, Malachi chapter 4, verse, first verse. God makes another promise. Here, Israel, they... The people of God, they know the promises that were given in Genesis 3.15. They haven't seen it fulfilled yet. Wait, someone is coming who's going to be a descendant of Eve, who's going to, he's going to be a man, and he's going to crush Satan. Well, that hasn't happened yet. Israel knew that at this time. Israel was at their lowest in terms of their national history in Malachi chapter 4. They had been decimated. The northern kingdom had been basically eradicated. They had been 70 years in prison over in Babylon. Now they got to, some of them got to come back to the land. Uh, the temple won't be the same. Bad news. Many were probably wondering, wow, what, what happened to that promise that God gave in Genesis 3.15 of a, a man who would come and conquer Satan? And then, Oh yeah, and then that promise in Genesis 12 given to Abraham, our father, that, that he'd become a great nation. And through him, all the families of the earth would be blessed. That hasn't happened yet. So God gives more hope here at 400 B.C. For behold, here's some good news. The day is coming. Don't, don't give up. Promises haven't been fulfilled yet. It's still future. The day is coming. The day is coming. The day of what? The day of good news. The day of fulfillment. The day of the Messiah is coming still. 
great anticipation and then something needs to happen before that Messiah of Genesis 3.15 and Genesis 12.3 comes. Verse 5, Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the... And then really it's when the Messiah comes. So before this Messiah comes... Elijah has to come and announce his coming and roll out the red carpet and point to him and say, Behold the King. Behold the Messiah. Behold the one who fulfills promises. And so that's how the Old Testament ends. That's how our Old Testament... I mean, it's literally like the last verse in the Old Testament. Imagine yourself as a Jew in the days of Theophilus and Luke and Mary and all the Jews in their day, particularly people like Theophilus or just Jews who don't, maybe don't believe or don't know all the details the apostles do, and there's been 400 years of silence. Wow, 400 years there hasn't been a prophet. 400 years there hasn't been a new Old Testament book written. 400 years we haven't heard from God. What's all this silence? What about these promises? What about the coming Elijah? I can't believe Elijah hasn't come yet. It's been 400 years. So then we fast forward to 2,000 years ago to the Gospel of Luke. Let's go there, Luke chapter 1. Now it's 60 A.D. Jesus, the Messiah, has indeed come. Not everybody saw him. Not everybody experienced him firsthand. Some did. The apostles did. They were eyewitnesses. Luke has been told about this Jesus. Luke believed. Luke became a Christian. Luke is now with the Apostle Paul. Luke gets to be with the Apostle Paul as an assistant, and the Apostle Paul has special privilege of talking literally to Jesus through visions. Luke is highly privileged. Luke, Luke became a believer. Luke became a receptacle of God Almighty and divine revelation. Luke is so privileged to write two of the longest books in the New Testament. Luke is an evangelist. He's an avid lover of Jesus. He loves lost people. He's discipling people. He's proclaiming the gospel. He's discipling people. Here's one that he's discipling. We saw it was Theophilus. This man probably who was significant, high-ranking official, probably became a believer, was a younger believer, didn't know everything, had a lot of ignorance, maybe had questions, at times was doubting his faith. He was being... Uh, dumped up by critics, maybe, or his culture, and at times had doubt, as we all have doubt. And Luke's job here in the Gospel of Luke is to get Theophilus secure in his faith. And that's how we started this, epistle, or this Gospel, and we saw that already in Luke chapter 1, verse 4, and this was for us as well. I'm writing these things down, all 24 chapters, and your English Bible says, Luke, so that you as a new believer, or you as a believer, regardless of how long you've been a believer, who say you know Jesus, believe in Jesus, I'm writing these things down in my gospel so that you may know the exact truth. One English translation we saw says, so that you may have certitude, certainty in your faith. That's one of the blessings of the gospel of Luke that we're going to see as we go through it. It's going to give us supernatural divine revelation that increases our faith, that gives us certainty and certitude. One thing you can be certain about in this uncertain life is the truth of the Bible. And that's what we're getting in the, get in the Gospel of Luke. So Luke begins to present his case. Now he's arguing that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the one who has saved you, Theophilus. He is the Old Testament Messiah. He's the only one. He's the only way to the Father. He is the Savior. He is your Master. He is your King. Well, Theophilus legitimately could say, well, how do I know that for sure? Give me some more information. Is there any proof? From a Jewish perspective, we know that to validate truth, especially legally and in the courtroom, you need the testimony of at least two or three witnesses. The more witnesses you had, the weightier, the stronger, the more binding the evidence. And that's what Luke decides, you know what, I'm going to give you, Theophilus, I'm going to give you a testimony of two witnesses. No, I'm going to give you a testimony of three witnesses. No, I'm going to give you a testimony of so many witnesses you can't imagine, so that you will have certainty in this Jesus as your Savior. That's what Luke chapter 1 is all about. Because you're reading it and you're like, well, why, are all, why is Luke introducing out of nowhere this guy named Zacharias? Who's he? Who, who cares? It's not in the other three Gospels. Who's Elizabeth? Who is she? Who cares? Then he skips over to Mary, which is where we are today. What's all this detail and information about Mary in Luke that's not in the other three Gospels? What's that all about? Because Luke is arguing his case, as he's led by the Spirit of God. So it's God telling these things. God is validating the truth about Jesus with the testimony of two or three witnesses, and these are significant biblical, scriptural, Old Testament witnesses. Because in Luke's mind or any Jew's mind of that day, okay, if this Jesus is the Messiah, then some things need to be true about him. If Jesus truly is the Messiah of the Old Testament that was prophesied, then 
That means that Elijah had to have come already. Because that's, that's how the Old Testament closed. And some might say, I don't see no Elijah. And Luke says, yeah, there was an Elijah. His name was John the Baptist. That's the whole point of Zacharias being introduced. Verse 17 of Luke, uh, we saw Luke chapter 1. Uh, Zacharias has promised that he's going to have a son. His name is going to be John. He's going to prepare the way of the Messiah. He's going to turn many hearts back to God from the nation of Israel, and he's going to fulfill prophecy in Malachi 4.6. He's going to go as the forerunner. And then Jesus said, yes, Elijah, John the Baptist was Elijah in that he was, had a ministry in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Elijah will come before the Messiah. Now something unique is happening. Elijah needs to come twice because there's two comings of the Messiah. They didn't know that in the Old Testament. They saw only one coming of the Messiah. So one coming of Elijah has already come for the first coming of Christ. Christ will come again, and another Elijah will come prior to the second coming of Christ. I don't know if you knew that. So there will be two comings of Elijah, just as there are two comings of the Messiah. Both of those were not seen with clarity in the Old Testament. The first coming of the Messiah was John the Baptist in the spirit and the power of of Elijah. That's very clear in Luke 1.17. So the Jew is like, oh, okay. Granted, I will accept that argument that John the Baptist fulfilled the prophecy of Malachi chapter 4. But this, if the Messiah comes, he also has to be born of a virgin because Isaiah said in 800 BC that the Messiah would be born of a virgin. And then that's what we saw last week in Luke chapter 1, where Jesus came and he was born of the Virgin Mary and fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. Miraculously, no one in the history of planet Earth has ever been or ever will be born of a virgin. Isaiah 7, 14, many other verses actually. And so Luke is mounting his case with not just rational arguments and proof, biblical evidence. Jesus fulfilled these prophecies. Then we're going to see today that Mary alludes to or directly references, actually, promises that were made to Abraham. We just read one of them in Genesis chapter 12. Well, if Jesus truly is the Messiah, then he has to be a descendant of Abraham, and he has to fulfill the promises of Abraham. And so in Mary's song of praise today, it concludes by her referencing, really, the promise God made in the Abrahamic covenant. And we're going to see that at the very end of verse 55. So Jesus, indeed, was the seed of Abraham who would bless the nations of the world. Not only that, Jesus was the seed of the woman in Genesis 3.15. Jesus meets all of the biblical qualifications. And as Luke goes chapter by chapter, it just keeps happening. Jesus keeps fulfilling prophecy after prophecy after prophecy after prophecy, sometimes out of Jesus' own mouth. We're going to see in Luke chapter 4 in the synagogue. He reads Isaiah, puts it down and says, this day the scripture is fulfilled in before you, Isaiah, I am the Messiah. And everybody doesn't clap and say, yay, I I always knew it was you, Jesus. Instead, they get furious, grind their teeth, chase him out of the synagogue and try to throw him off a cliff and kill him. Wasn't always welcome. So let's go ahead and look at our passage today. And also, I think Luke's purpose here Because Luke said in chapter 1, I want to give you certitude about believing in Jesus as the Messiah, and I'm going to go to first-hand witnesses, first-generation witnesses, people who actually knew Jesus. Now, if you want to know somebody and know the most about somebody and the secrets about somebody and the best about somebody and the worst about somebody, who do you go to? You go to their mother. You go to their family. They can put up a facade and a charade, and then you got to do your investigative journalism and get behind the scenes and find out, well, I'm going to find out about this guy's family. How did he grow up? What do his siblings say about him? What does his mother know about him? Well, that's what Luke does. Let's go ahead and look at it. I called the sermon today Mary's Song because it is, it's kind of like a song. It's kind of like a hymn, but not technically. Really what it is, it's just a response to her friend Elizabeth. Elizabeth is older. Elizabeth is probably, I don't know if she's a cousin or an aunt, an aunt, an aunt, wherever you're from. But she's definitely related to Elizabeth. And she was told that Elizabeth is with child. And Elizabeth was advanced in years. This is a work of God. Uh, Mary's as excited could be, so she's going to go find her relatives. Uh, We'll just call her Aunt Elizabeth and Uncle Zacharias. And then when Elizabeth sees Mary and welcomes her into her home, uh, Elizabeth is so excited to see Elizabeth. 
And then Elizabeth asked Mary a question, and Mary's answer to Elizabeth, Aunt Elizabeth's question is the bulk of this passage that we're going to look at today. People call it, I think people formalize it too much. Song, hymn, it's not a prayer. Some people have mistaken that and said it's a prayer. No, it's just, it's an answer to Elizabeth's question. It is amazing, it's profound, it's staggering, divinely inspired response. But it's just a response to Mary, or Elizabeth. We're going to examine it. Let's go ahead and read the passage. Uh, We'll start at verse 39. Mary had just received the news from an angel that she was with child and actually going to give birth to the Messiah miraculously. Not only that, she was told that even her relative Elizabeth in verse 36 has also conceived a son in her old age. And she's in her sixth month now, which is a miracle. Mary can't believe it. She is so excited. Verse 39. So now at this time, when Mary heard the news about Elizabeth and about herself, she arose and went in a hurry to the hill country to a city of Judah. She's going to find Mary or Elizabeth, Aunt Elizabeth. Verse 40, maybe she was praying for Elizabeth. Maybe the whole family was praying for Elizabeth. Maybe the whole family or some family members were kind of embarrassed that Elizabeth couldn't have children. That could be a shameful thing. So this is great cause of celebration. She runs to Elizabeth's house. Verse 40, she entered the house of Zacharias. There's Uncle Zacharias. She greeted Elizabeth. Probably just a big old hug, kisses. Verse 41, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting... She entered the house and saw Zacharias and said, Oh, Uncle Zacharias, so long. Oh, is Elizabeth around? So Elizabeth probably in there doing the dishes and heard Mary's voice. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby in her womb, the baby, the person made in the image of God, in her womb, leaped in her womb when she heard The words of Mary. Wow. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. She cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. Mary, you're blessed. Your baby is blessed. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? Elizabeth had insider information. Where'd she get it? From her hubby. Her hubby, Zacharias, he was in the temple. He had a one-on-one conversation with an angel who told him, your wife is going to have a child in your old age. That's a miracle. Hey, let me even do double or greater than that. Not only is is she going to have a baby, he's going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. And Zacharias, he can't believe it. He doubted God. He got punished for who knows how many months. Wasn't allowed to speak, and he's doing sign language all the time, literally communicating to the family. Then when baby comes, they, God allows him to hear again or to speak. And then probably at that time, Zacharias is filling uh, Elizabeth in. Man, you, it's amazing. here's what happened. I didn't believe it first, but now I do. Here, honey, listen to this. Not only are you going to have a baby, he's already in your womb. He's going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. And they are both from a priestly line. So this is great significance. And she knows that Mary's the one, her own relative, her own sweet niece. And that's why she's so amazed that the mother of my Lord, what that means, the mother of the coming Messiah is coming to visit me. For behold, verse 44, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. So she knows that the fact that the baby, that's John the Baptist, who was actually filled with the Spirit of God while he was in the womb. That didn't happen to you, that didn't happen to me. This was a unique work of God on John the Baptist as the forerunner of the Messiah. When John the Baptist heard Mary, who was about to carry the Messiah, some supernatural transaction took place, and John just got excited as could, could be in the womb, and he's just jumping for joy inside that womb. Mary knew something unique and different was going on. Not only the, It wasn't the baby just leaped. The baby was leaping for joy. John the Baptist was celebrating inside the womb. 
It's a person. It's a baby. It has emotions. It's filled with the Spirit. It's not it. It's He. He has joy. Verse 45, And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. See, Elizabeth, she was born and raised in the synagogue. She's a Jew. She's from the priestly line. She knew the Old Testament inside and out. She knew the promises that had to be fulfilled. She knew that a forerunner had to come. She knew Malachi chapter 4. She knew that her own son John the Baptist fulfilled that prophecy. She knew that the Messiah was coming. She knew Isaiah 7.14. She knew that the Messiah had to be born of a virgin. She now knew probably that Mary would be that virgin. Verse 45, and blessed is she who believed there would be a fulfillment of what had come. And then, uh, so Mary asked a question, I mean, Elizabeth asked a question earlier on. Uh, First she said blessing, and then her question is in verse 43, how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come now? So that's a question she's asking. So Mary, I can't believe, why are you coming to visit me? In light of all these grand, amazing truths, fulfillment of Scripture, How can I be so graced by your presence? Why are you here? So here's Mary's response. It's not a song. It's not a hymn. It's Mary's response to Elizabeth. But we've really never seen a response like this in human history. These are Mary's words. These are Mary's thoughts. And at the same time, these are the words of Almighty God and the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God was superintending Mary as she spoke. It is so exquisite. It does come across on a human level as a poem as a song, as a hymn, because it is so elegant the way it is set forth. She did this at the time of Jesus' birth, around the time of her pregnancy, which would have been about 30, uh, or around, yeah, 30 years prior to Jesus, 33 years prior to Jesus dying, so around the turn of the century at that time. And so here's, let's look at Mary's response to Elizabeth. Verse 46, just follow as I read. Here's what Mary said. She didn't sing this. Here's what she said. Here's my answer to you, Elizabeth. You're obviously excited. The baby inside of you, John, he's excited. I'm also excited. Mary said, my soul exalts the Lord. That's joy. Verse 47, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. She is just exuberant. She is filled with joy. Mary is at these amazing truths. She's just heard verse 48. For he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave, God. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me, Mary, blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation toward toward those who fear him. Not everyone, but towards those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He scattered those who were proud and In the thoughts of their heart, he has brought down the rulers from their thrones. He's exalted those who are humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, and he sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, Old Testament fathers, starting with Abraham, there it is. God spoke to Abraham. God spoke to Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, that a Messiah would come from Abraham, that all the... Families of the earth would be blessed from the Messiah. As God spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his descendants forever. That was her response. Verse 56, and Mary stayed with Elizabeth, her relative, for about three months. In other words, till Elizabeth came to a full pregnancy and John the Baptist was born. And then she returned home. Let's go ahead and look at We're just going to make some observations of this song of Mary. It's too rich to exhaust. There are so many thoughts running through my head about it when you just read it, meditate upon it, look at the quality of it, the depth of it, the breadth of it. Just several things just jumped off the page when I read it. First of all, it was less spontaneous. She wasn't sitting down and thinking, hmm, okay, what do I need in my next verse in my poem? How many syllables should I have so that it matches and rhymes and there's proper... No, this is a a spontaneous move of the Spirit of God in her heart, using information and knowledge that she already had, using her love for God that she already had. She knew the Lord. She loved the Lord. We know that from her words. She also was raised in the synagogue. 
Her mind was saturated with biblical truth from the Old Testament, evident here. As a matter of fact, just about every one of these verses is either a direct quotation from Old Testament scripture or an allusion to it. And they're just perfectly balanced. God is mentioned in every verse here. God is the subject in every verse here. Not only is God mentioned, she accentuates what God has done, the work of God. And it's not work that God has done for her. God, gimme, gimme, gimme. It's what God has done for others all throughout. Mary was a humble woman. You see that all throughout. She was humble. She had marks of humility. She's other-oriented. She's not thinking about herself. She's thinking about God, how great God is, all the attributes of God. They are In every verse, she just extols the virtues, the attributes, and the characteristics of God, his character, his nature. So she is totally God-centered. It's not about her. That's humility. She understands her standing before a holy God. She calls him holy, and two times she refers to herself as a bondservant, as a slave. She knows her place. God is my master. I am his slave. She's the first person in the New Testament that refers to themselves as a slave of God, a slave of the Lord, which is the mark of a true Christian. So she's humble. She gives God his due position in light of his great attributes. Not only that, the great things he has done. And again, it's not things that he's done for her. She recites Old Testament history. Maybe even chronologically, she's talking all that God has done. She does a a string of these seven verbs at the end, verses 51 to 54, seven references of what God has done. And this is all throughout history, and it's probably from things she knows from the Old Testament history as she's going through that. And here, listen to the verbs she uses of what God has done. He has done mighty deeds. He scattered. He brought down. He exalted. He filled. He sent away. He has given. He remembered. So she's other-oriented. So it's about God and what God has done for other people. It's what God has done for her people, her descendants, the Israelites. She identifies, identifies with a community of people. It's not about self. She's not individualistic. She sees herself among a community and family of believers and a heritage of saints. She's a humble woman. One commentator said that Mary's about 13 years old here. No, she's not. We don't know that, and it doesn't matter. She is a young woman. She was living at home. She isn't married yet. We don't know how old she was. But that's just a side note and kind of a distraction. We know that Joseph, in Genesis, at age 17, he was called a young man. And at 17, Joseph, he wasn't married. He was living with his dad, his parents. He was dependent upon his parents, age 17. His older brothers called him a boy. That's 17. So just, I wanted to highlight that, that, that I think that's a myth that got out and everybody believed it. And You know, people in the, Old Testament, or in the New Testament, Jesus, they got married when they were nine. I don't know if you've ever heard that one. But Mary is now of marrying age, whatever that is. She's still a young woman, though. And what I want to do is I want to uh, just walk through the passage, highlight a couple things, and then I want to really focus in on something that just jumped out at me blatantly that I, I actually didn't, I, I studied it and then I looked at a bunch of commentaries I was thinking, I wonder, this is so obvious, I wonder if any of the commentaries, and none of the commentaries I read even mention this, but I thought it was like the main thing in the passage. So I want to get to that. But first, just I want to clear the air on a couple of things, because people have wrong views about Mary. I know I did. Uh, as a Roman Catholic growing up for 18 years, uh, I was taught to pray to Mary, worship Mary, especially on May 1st, where we had to go to church, and there was a big old statue of Mary. We'd go up and we'd kiss the feet of the statue of Mary. We would pray to Mary on the rosary. We would ask, we pray to her to intercede to God to get forgiveness of sin. Praying to dead people, that's called necromancy. That was cursed in Deuteronomy, and the penalty of it was death in the Bible. Don't pray to dead people. Mary was a dead person. She was also called co mediatrix. She's the mediator between God and man. Timothy says there's one mediator, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Mary's not a mediator. I was taught that Mary was sinless. She never sinned in her life. That's not true. She was a sinner just like you and me. She was just as despicable in her own heart as anybody else. She knew that, too. She calls the Lord her Savior. She needs a Savior. I remember when I read the Bible for the first time at age 19, I couldn't believe what I was reading when I was reading Luke. I was like, what? Wait, this is, really? Mary said that? I've been misled. That's literally how I felt. Mary was sinless. Mary never had 
children. Mary was a perpetual virgin. That's not true. Mary had several children through Joseph. Mary is not to be worshipped. She is not perfect. Well, what about here where Elizabeth said, blessed are you and the fruit of thy womb, blessed are you. Well, there are plenty of Old Testament saints where that exact phrase is taken from. Leah and other Old Testament saints were blessed by God. Hannah was blessed by God. doesn't mean they were perfect. They were just favored by God. Job was favored and blessed by God. If you're a believer and you're a Christian, then you're blessed by God. It doesn't mean you're perfect. So we had to address that issue, that we've got to have the right view of Mary. She was a sinner. She was dependent upon God's grace. She had to put her faith in Jesus Christ as the Savior. She eventually did. And God was preparing her heart from the time that first visitation. And then another issue in verse 41, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Just this idea of being filled with the Holy Spirit. This was a unique one-time ministry that happened on Elizabeth. This is not routine. This didn't happen to all believers in Jesus' day or John's day. This was a unique work of the Holy Spirit that happened periodically and sporadically at God's sovereign discretion throughout history. This idea of being filled with the Spirit. All that means is that it was a unique work of God going on in history, particularly for someone God was going to use in a very unique one-time manner. And Elizabeth was that very vehicle. She would give birth to Elijah or John the Baptist. And so she was prepared with the Holy Spirit in a unique way. So this isn't, you can't point to this passage and say, yeah, all Christians need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and what that means is speaking in tongues because that's what many would tell us. Speaking with, with tongues means speaking or being filled with the Holy Spirit. That, that's not what this is talking about. This is unique one-time ministry, the Spirit of God, because he was going to use Elizabeth in a unique way. Okay, now let's go to Mary's words to Elizabeth, and we'll just walk through it real quick. And what I want to do, this is what jumped out at me. Every verse, almost every statement that Mary makes, is she highlights an attribute of God, a, a virtue of God. And it was amazing as I'm going through, and she hardly repeats one. They're just, by the time I was done, I got 20 plus attributes of God that Mary says in this prayer. Actually, it's not a prayer. In this statement. And this is why she had joy. You can't have true, by the way, the words for joy there, um, in verse 46, my soul exalts and exalt uh, megalune magnificat, magnificat in Latin, the Latin Bible. Who cares about the Latin Bible? The Greek Bible says megalune. This is the megalune. And it's emphatic for her joy as she exalts God in an exuberant manner. And she has uh, just this emphatic joy inside is the second part of that verse. My spirit has rejoiced. That word for rejoice is just a very strong word for having joy, inner joy, deep-seated joy, joy in the inner person in light of the fact it was in her soul and spirit. It was unequal joy. It's a joy that no one else can have if they don't know Jesus personally and they don't know God and they don't know the right things about God and don't worship him the wrong way and they don't worship in spirit and truth. There's only one way to have this kind of unmatched joy. And it comes from knowing God for who he is, which is dictated from the Bible. And you can't think the, right, think the right way about God and pray to him if you have a skewed view of God and his attributes. So let's just run through it and let's look at these attributes of God. Starting at verse 46, Mary says, My soul exalts the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Attribute number one is she calls him God. That's deity. God is deity. He is the creator. He is worthy of of worship. Also in verse 46, she says, my, exul, uh, my soul exalts the Lord. She calls him Kurios. He is Lord. She, that's an attribute. God is Lord. He is master. He is in charge. He is the boss. I am his slave. I am his servant. She understands that. I serve him. I beckon his call. His command is the only one that matters. That's how she lived her life. At least that's how she's thinking. So those are two attributes. God's deity, and the fact she calls him Lord means his attribute there is his sovereignty. He is in control. His deity and his sovereignty. Uh, then she goes, my spirit is rejoiced in God, my Savior. What is this? The attribute of forgiveness. God is a forgiving God. Do you believe that? Oh, I'm horrible. I'm a lousy sinner. I'm terrible. I know you are. That's my counsel. Don't come to me for counsel. I'm terrible, Pastor Cliff. Amen. Keep preaching. I'm not worthy. Yeah, that's right. I'm terrible. Yeah, that's true too. So am I. We need a Savior. We need a forgiving God. That's Jesus. What else are the attributes about God she believed? Verse 48. For he has regard for the humble state of his bond slave. 
He has regard for the humble state of... I just put that he is personal. This is where she is talking about herself. He, God is, it's not just God's worried about a crowd. It's Mary. I care about Mary. Her as an individual. This is the intimacy of God, the relational character of God, that God is a personal being. He deals with all of us one by one. It's an important attribute. We don't get lost in the mass. Uh, what else does she say about him? For he has regard for the humble state. He's personal. For behold, uh, from this time to generation, uh, he has regard. He's kind. He has regard for me. He cares. He tends to our needs. God is kind. Verse 49, what else about God and his attributes? He's the mighty one. He can do great things. God is powerful. If you want to say God is omnipotent or all-powerful, that would work. That's the God we serve. That's the God we know through Jesus Christ. He is the powerful one. He does the impossible. He does great things for us. Verse 49, what's the other attribute? He's holy. Holy is his name. What does that mean? He's sinless. He is perfect. He's sinless. He's perfect. He is to be feared. He can't tolerate sin. So holiness, the perfection of God. We are awed by God. Verse 50, and his mercy is upon generation after generation. He is merciful. That's different than forgiving. Merciful, that means he withholds the wrath that we deserve. That's mercy. And it's towards, it is conditional. It's towards those who fear him. Verse 51, what other attribute? He's done mighty deeds with his arm. Again, he is uh, sovereign. Uh, verse 51, he has scattered those who were proud. In the thoughts of his heart, he's scattered. He's a God of wrath. He's a God of judgment. Not only that, he's a just God. It's appropriate. Justice belongs to God. He will bring justice in the perfect time. Verse 52 goes on with the wrath and judgment of God. He brought down rulers from their thrones. He's sovereign. He controls nations, leaders. They're in the palm of his hand. He's exalted those who were humble. He raises them up. Again, he's gracious. He exalted those who were humble. Verse 53, he's filled the hungry with good things. He is the provider. God is a provider. That's an attribute. Verse 53, do you believe God is a provider? Do you have any needs right now? Do you go to this God who is great and can do all things? Do you trust him as the provider? Do you know him as your personal savior? He sends away the rich empty-handed. Again, he's a just God. He discriminates. He's a discriminating God. That's another attribute. He's a discriminating God. In a good way. And that has to do with his justice. Verse 54, he has given help to Israel, his servant. So he's a helper. He's, he helps us. God is my helper. Also, he remembers his promises. In other words, verse 54, the fact that he remembers is that he is faithful. He's faithful to keep his promises. God is faithful. Always, 100% of the time. He always comes through. He's actually the only one that you can ultimately trust. Don't trust people, ultimately. Or, put it another way, you can count on it, even your best friend's going to let you down at some point. Not God. Verse 55, he spoke, he's the living God. That's an attribute, he's the living God. Verse 55, he, he's a masculine, he's male, God is male, that's an attribute. God is not a female. That's how he's revealed himself, as male. That means something. Verse 55, to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. Again, that's his faithfulness to his promises. This, so maybe you came up with about 20 attributes. This is the God that Mary knew at that young age. This is the God that she knew because she was informed by Scripture. This was the God that she knew that she could worship and as a result have uncomparable joy deep within her soul and in her spirit. And you know what? We can have the same. If we have this view of God routinely and meditate upon it and talk to him that way and pray to him like that, you can have a deep-seated joy that you've never experienced that is personal, that is subjective, that is real, that is biblical. It is elusive up and down based on our walk with God, but it is real. It's a treasure. It's a gift. That's God's intent for us as his children. We can trust in this living God. We have the privilege to do that. Thank you, Mary, for those words to us. Now we have the privilege for those of us who know Christ to celebrate communion. So I'm going to pray as Tim comes up and leads us in communion this morning. Father, we thank you for our time together. The truth of your word, even though it's 2,000 years old, your spirit makes it come alive for those who have ears to hear. And we thank you that you make that possible through your Holy Spirit. We pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen.